Well, good evening. We're going to begin with the hymn number 264, please. Hymn number 264, page number 283. In loving kindness Jesus came, my soul in mercy to reclaim, and from the depths of sin and shame, through grace he lifted me. 264, standing after the introduction, please.
Amen. Now let's seek the Lord's face in a word of prayer together, please. Every head bowed and every eye closed in the Master's presence. Eternal God and loving Heavenly Father, we do thank Thee and praise Thee tonight. For each one that can cry in this gathering tonight, He lifted me. And Father, we realize the danger of sin. We understand that it is like a mire that, that sucks us in and we were on, on sinking sand when we were without Christ. But we praise Thee for everyone, and we mean it tonight, everyone that can truly lift up their heart's voice and say, I'm saved, I'm delivered, I've been pulled from the miry clay, my feet have been set upon the rock, Christ Jesus, and praise God, He lifted me. But, oh, Father, we do pray for those in our gathering that as yet are not saved, and they're still in the sinking sand, and they're still sinking deeper and deeper, quicker and quicker, and they're coming to the edge, and we realize they need salvation. They need to be rescued. They need to be lifted. Oh, Father, show them tonight that they can have their sins forgiven. Show them tonight that they can be redeemed through the blood of the cross. Show them that Christ died for the ungodly. And praise God, Christ died for them if they would only trust in Him. And oh God, we pray that that move in their hearts, that Thou would awaken them to their need. Show them the peril that they are in. Show them that hell is real, that sin is serious, that death is, is imminent for any of us, for we don't know what tomorrow may bring. And help us to prepare to meet thy God. Oh, Father, we do pray for each one that maybe knows they need to be saved, and yet they're saying, another time, preacher, another time. Oh, Father, show them the urgency of the matter. Show them that the Scriptures say it is time to seek the Lord. Show them that the Scriptures tell them, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, today is the day of salvation. We ask that thou show them that, that they must seek the Lord while there is time and that they must call upon Him while He is near. Oh, Father, we realize that the fact we're all in this gospel service tonight, that Thou hast been merciful to our souls. We realize those of us that are saved, the fact that we're here, we can say, there go I, but the grace of God, I was in the sinking sand, and the fact I'm here tonight, saved by God's grace, I'm praising Him for His mercy. But, oh God, we realize the fact that there may be unsaved in the gathering tonight. Oh, how that's a mercy from thy hand. We pray that thou would show men and women that tonight may be the last gospel opportunity they ever have presented to them and help them to realize the urgency that we read in Genesis that my spirit shall not always strive with man, that there may not be another opportunity in the gospel there may not be another opportunity to be found in Money Slain Free Presbyterian Church at a gospel service and help them to flee to Christ and flee from the wrath to come before it be too late. Oh God, we realize that we live in such a, a materialistic age today. We live in an age where people think they can do whatever they please. We live in an age where people time and time again, reject God and further to that, wave their puny fist in thy face and dare say, no God for me, no God for me. But, O oh, Father, we pray that tonight thou would open blinded eyes, that thou would remove the heart of stone and replace it with a heart of flesh. And we plead of thee that there may be not only great rejoicing in the whole of heaven over one sinner that repenteth, but also tonight that there will be great rejoicing in money slain over one sinner that repenteth. Lord, we long to see a soul come through for Christ. Maybe there's somebody here and they know the gospel. They've heard the gospel, maybe even read in the gospel, and they know what they need to do, and yet they've put it off week after week, year after year, decade after decade. We pray that tonight will be the night where they stop playing around with this issue of salvation when they do business with God. But, Father, bless us abundantly in this meeting. We do pray that Thou bless those that can't be with us tonight, those that would love to be at the house of God, and yet they can't be here. We ask that Thou be unto them all that they need. We pray for those that have been 
that have been in hospital in recent days as well. We ask that thou comfort them as a great physician. We pray that thou touch them, restore them to full health and strength afresh in these days. And Lord, we continue to remember those that have been bereaved of late as well. Oh, thou knowest that the heart is aching, the heart feels broken. But Lord, we ask that thou bind up the open wounds, that thou give the peace which passeth all understanding, the peace that can only come from the Lord Jesus Christ. But Father, we ask, bless us now, bless every aspect of this service from the very first word to the very last, amen. We ask that everything said and done may be said and done to thine honor and to thy glory, to the exaltation of Christ our King, the one that we believe is the sole King and head of his church. We ask that he would receive the glory tonight. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hymn number 270, please. 270, page number 285. And a beautiful hymn we have before us, Down at the cross where my Saviour died, Down with a cleansing from sin I cried, There to my heart was the blood applied, Glory to His name. And arousing him. so let's really sing it out, Blow away the cobwebs, I enjoy good singing. So let's see if we can have some good singing tonight. Hymn number 270, standing after the introduction. good singing. Now a turning in the Word of God tonight, please, to the book of Zephaniah, the book of Zephaniah. And if you find the break between the Old and the New Testament, and you work backwards back into the Old Testament, Zephaniah is the fourth book from the end. So the fourth book from the end of the Old Testament 
the book of Zephaniah and the chapter 1. We're going to read the whole of this chapter together, only 18 verses. In a moment, our text, God willing, will be the verse 18. We're going to be looking at the title, The Bankruptcy of Materialism. The Bankruptcy of Materialism. But Zephaniah chapter 1, let's begin our reading together at the verse 1. Zephaniah 1 and the verse 1. The word of the Lord which came unto Zephaniah the son of Cushi, the son of Gedaliah, the son of Amariah, the son of Hezkiah, in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah. And what words these are, listen to them. Verse 2. I will utterly consume all things from off the land, saith the Lord. I will consume man and beast. I will consume the fowls of the heaven and the fishes of the sea and the stumbling blocks of the wicked. And I will cut off man from off the land, saith the Lord. I will also stretch out mine hand upon Judah and upon all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And I will cut off the remnant of Baal from this place and the name of the Chemrims of the priests. And them that worship the host of heaven upon the housetops, and them that worship and that swear by the Lord, and that swear by Malchim. Verse 6. And them that are turned back from the Lord, and those that have not sought the Lord, nor inquired for him. Hold thy peace at the presence of the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is at hand, for the Lord hath prepared a sacrifice. He hath bid his guests. And it shall come to pass in the day of the Lord's sacrifice that I will punish the princes and the king's children and all such as are clothed with strange apparel. In the same day also will I punish all those that leap on the threshold which fill their master's houses with violence and deceit. And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord, that there shall be the noise of a cry from the fish gate and an howling from the second and a great crashing from the hills. Howl, ye inhabitants of Maktesh, for all the merchant people are cut down, all they that bear silver are cut off. And it shall come to pass at that time that I will search Jerusalem with candles and punish the men that are settled on their lees that say in their heart, the Lord will not do good, neither will he do evil. Therefore their goods shall become a booty, and their houses a desolation. They shall also build houses, but not inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards, but not drink the wine thereof. The great day of the Lord is near, it is near, and hasteneth greatly, even the voice of the day of the Lord. The mighty man shall cry there bitterly. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of the trumpet and alarm against the fenced cities and against the high towers. And I will bring distress upon men, that they shall walk like blind men, because they have sinned against the Lord." And their blood shall be poured out as dust, and their flesh as the dung. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath. But the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy, for he shall make even a speedy riddance of all them that dwell in the land. We trust the Lord to bless the public reading of his holy and precious word to each of our hearts. At this point in the service, let me welcome each one to the house of God tonight. It is good to see you all, and we especially welcome those visiting with us tonight, and we trust the Lord will bless us as we gather around the scriptures of truth. Now, announcements for the week ahead. Please remember on Wednesday at 8 p.m., the Bible study and prayer meeting, where God willing, we will be continuing on with our series in the book of Jonah. Then on Thursday at the same time, 8 p.m., the workers' prayer meeting. And then on Friday, there'll be no youth fellowship due to the Easter convention. So please remember that, young people, there'll be no youth fellowship this coming Friday. 
But then on Saturday at 11 a.m., we will be recommencing our open-air witnesses in the square at Rath Island. And if you can, please do come and stand with us and sing the hymns with us as we endeavor to reach our community with the gospel of saving grace. So that's Saturday at 11 a.m., and if you're able and free, I trust that you'll come and support us. Then the services next Lord's Day, the Sabbath school and Bible class at 10.45 in the morning, the morning worship at 12 noon, preceded by prayer at 11.30, and then the evening gospel service at 7 p.m., preceded by prayer at 6.30. And next Sunday will be our Whitfield College Covenant offering. Now our next session meeting is due for Monday the 18th of April at 8 p.m. And the next committee meeting is scheduled for Thursday the 21st of April at 8 p.m. Therefore, brethren, any items for the various agendas need to be submitted either to the clerk of session or the committee secretary before Saturday, please. Then let me remind you that we are having a congregational meeting for the communicant members uh, scheduled for Wednesday the 20th of April at 8 p.m., where we will be voting on an item to do with the Charity Commission, and we'll give you more detail as we draw closer to that date so it's fresh in your memories and minds. Then as you leave, the Ulster Bulwark is available, also the Let the Bible Speak magazine. But please do continue to pray for those that have been sick in the previous week. There have been a number that have been unwell in the church family in recent times, and please pray for them. Please remember those that are shut in who would love to be out at the house of God, and for one reason or another, they can't be here. And please remember those that have been bereaved in the past week and also in recent weeks and months as well, that the Lord would draw very near and give help, even at a time of loss. But of course, all of these announcements are subject to the will and mind of the Lord. But we're going to sing again, 283, please. Hymn number 283. "'Twas Jesus my Saviour who died on the tree to open a fountain for sinners like me. His blood is that fountain which pardon bestows and cleanses the foulest wherever it flows." Hymn number 283, page number 290, We'll stand after the introduction, please.
Now, turning in the Word of God back to that portion we read earlier, please, in Zephaniah, Zephaniah chapter 1, and we're looking at the verse 18 together, or at least the first part of the verse 18. It says there, Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 18, Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath. The bankruptcy of materialism. With the word of God open before us, let's seek the Lord's face in a word of prayer together, please. Let us all pray. Heavenly Father, we do still ourselves in thy presence now. And we thank thee that the Lion of Judah shall break every chain and give us the victory again and again. And Father, we ask that some soul may have the chains of sin and the shackles of sin broken from off them tonight that they may trust the Lord Jesus Christ, that they may trust the one that is termed in Scripture as the Lion of Judah, that they would repent and believe the gospel. So, Lord, we pray, speak through thy truth. We ask that every word may go forth as thus and thus saith the Lord tonight. Lord, we pray that the words and the philosophies and the theories of Daniel Henderson may fall to the ground and be forgotten but we pray that thy word may find a resting place. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We live in a day and a generation of materialism. We live in a day and a generation of stuff. People love stuff, whatever it is. Could be cars, could be houses, could be full bank accounts could be just having whatever tickles your fancy. And we live in a day where it's so easy to be like that now. For those of you that are au fait with online shopping and all those things, just with the click of a button, you can have anything you want as long as you can afford it, and it's delivered right to your doorstep. We live in a day of materialism, and we live in a day of stuff, And we live in a day where that is all people seem to desire to live for. We live in a day where people have more stuff than they have ever had before. In previous generations, people would have scraped together just to put food on the table. But now, everybody, it seems, especially all of the young people, they have all of the gadgets, all of the things that are going, and there's no struggles, no real struggles anymore. And we live in a day where people have everything their hearts could ever desire. We find Zephaniah chapter 1 is a day just like that. It's a day of King Josiah. Look what it says in chapter 1 and the verse 1 at the end of that verse. says, in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah. Well, that's the type of day we were living in. Oh, there's no shortage of silver and gold in Zephaniah chapter 1. There's no shortage of stuff. There's no shortage of possessions. There's no shortage of material wealth. We live in a day like Zephaniah chapter 1 where people have stuff. And yet in the verse 18, we are warned that it doesn't matter how much you can accumulate, doesn't matter how much money you can save, doesn't matter what type of car is on the driveway, doesn't matter what type of house you live in, doesn't matter whatever things you collect in this life, the Bible tells us when it comes to sin, when it comes to judgment, and when it comes to getting right with a holy God, it says in the verse 18, neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath. And it's true today, friend, not only true of Zephaniah's day, but true today for all of the stuff the people have. None of it will save them. None of it will profit their souls. And we came into this world with nothing, and we will leave this world with nothing more. And it doesn't matter how wealthy we become, none of it will be able to deliver us in the day of the Lord's wrath. It's very interesting when we look at Zephaniah chapter 1. Look at the verse 2 with me, please. This is a chapter of judgment. This is a chapter where the Lord is 
is, well, excuse the phrase, but fed up with their sin. He is fed up. He is a long-suffering God, and yet he is beginning to pronounce judgment upon them. We'll look at that and the reasons for it a little later on. But look at the verse 2. The Lord is very clear. He says, I will utterly consume all things from off the land, saith the Lord. Doesn't matter what you have. Doesn't matter the possessions you have. This is the bankruptcy of materialism. And the Lord has said, I will utterly consume all things from off the land. And we find the reason for it. Look at the verse 4. Because they were worshipping other gods. They were worshipping Baal. They were worshipping statues. Look what it says. Verse 4. I will also stretch out mine hand upon Judah and upon all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. I will cut off the remnant of Baal from this place. That's the reason. Because when they gathered all of this stuff together, when they had all of this material wealth they decided to turn against God and follow after Baal. Do we not live in a day like that? Do we not live in a day where people have everything they desire? There's no real struggles. Yes, we, we talk about the cost of living today, and yes, things tighten up a wee bit, and fuel prices go up, and gas price, and all, all the rest of it. And yes, we don't like it. We don't like paying more, and all the rest of it. But really, in reality... We live in a day where we have more, more things and more wealth than maybe previous generations before us. And sadly, when such materialism comes in, what do people do? They forget the Lord. They forget the God that provided it all. They forget the one that has blessed them and given his common graces to them. And look at the verse 6 with me. We find further to this, it says, And them that are turned back from the Lord, and those that have not sought the Lord, nor inquired for Him. You see, that's the problem. That's the problem with Zephaniah's day, and that's the problem of our day. People have turned away from the Lord. They've not inquired of the Lord. They've not got any desire to seek for the Lord. I've got everything I could possess. I've got food on the table. I've got money in my bank account. I've got family around me. I've got everything I could ever want. So why would I inquire of the Lord? Doesn't it sound similar to our day and generation? Money slain, 2022. Look at the verse 7 with me. We read some solemn words here. It says, Hold thy peace at the presence of the Lord God. For the day of the Lord is at hand, for the Lord hath prepared a sacrifice. Now I want you to underline these next words. It says, he hath bid his guests. He hath bid his guests. I want you to underline that phrase, that, that sentence. He hath bid his guests. Here we find that the Lord is so angered with Jerusalem. God is so angered with his people. What we term there is sounding like a lovely, nice uh, phrase as the Lord has bid his guests. We, he's invited others in. What is he talking about? He's talking about inviting Babylon in to take over Jerusalem. He's talking about inviting King Nebuchadnezzar in to, to, to cause everything to be consumed. He hath bid his guests. He is allowing the stranger to come in and take everything in the land. What solemn words they are. And we find in the verse 8 a problem here. It says, verse 8, I will punish the princes and the king's children and all such. Look at it now. This is a wonderful illustration in the gospel. And all such as are clothed with strange apparel. I wonder, when you stand before God, what will you be dressed in? Or will you be dressed in your materialism and your gold and your silver and all your good works and everything you think you can do? Or, friend, will you be dressed in the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ, clothed in the righteousness of another, because Christ has paid your fine, Christ has paid your debt. And I wonder if the Lord is to look at you tonight, would he look at you and say, no, you're relying on good works, or would he look at you and say, no, you're relying on my son Christ? I ask, if the Lord examines your life, would he say, you're clothed with strange apparel? But anyway, let's keep going. What else do we find in this portion? Well, look at the verse 17. We'll jump a few verses. Look at the verse 17. It says, And I will bring distress upon them that they shall walk like blind men because they have sinned against the Lord. Oh, it sounds very similar, doesn't it? Sounds terribly similar to today. 
All men have everything, yet they walk around like blind men. They look at the beauty of creation. You step out those doors and you see the whole of the mountains at morn. You see the fields and at springtime with the lambs skipping around them. You hear the birds singing. You see it all. And yet none of you, none of those in their sin, none of them can see that it was the hand of God that created it all. They don't see the obvious before them. They walk around like blind men. Why is that the case? Why do they walk around like blind men? Well, look at the verse 12. We find the reason. Because in Zephaniah's day, in a day of materialism, in a day where there's so much wealth, we find that there was an apostate preacher or two as well. Sounds like our day and generation. Verse 12, And it shall come to pass at that time that I will search Jerusalem with candles and punish the men that are settled on their lees that say in their heart, the Lord will not do good, neither will he do evil. What are we reading off there? We're reading that these people are going to be walking around like blind men because the preachers and the ministers and the priests and those that ought to be telling them the truth and telling them, if you continue on in your sin, the Lord will bring judgment, but no. That is sitting back, as the scripture says, they're resting on their lees, They say, the Lord will not do anything, really. Sure, the Lord will accept you as you are. Sure, the Lord doesn't mind your sin. He he doesn't think good or evil of it. He doesn't care. Does it not sound like today? Does it not sound like our, our generation? Does it sound like many of our pulpits and our churches right across this province where people can commit sin after sin after sin and there's ministers too cowardly to tell them? That God hates sin and God will judge it. Well, it all sounds familiar. But look with me in chapter 1 and the verse 1 again. And some of you may have already asked this question. But it says at the end that all of this is going on in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah. Maybe you recall what you've been taught about King Josiah. And you remember him as the boy king, and you remember him as a a young man that has a heart to serve the Lord, and all of that is correct. But we find that still, in the early part of Josiah's reign, the nation was still evil, and the nation was still in its sin, and the, the nation still had to turn back to the Lord. Come with me to 2 Chronicles chapter 33. 2 Chronicles chapter 33, we find why the Lord is so angry. We find why the Lord is is fuming, to be quite honest with you, fuming. And why Zephaniah preaches the message that he preaches in Zephaniah chapter 1 and the verses 1 to 18. Because we find in 2 Chronicles the history of the kings of Judah. We find that Hezekiah was a godly king, but then his son Manasseh comes to the throne says in 2 Chronicles 33, look at the verses 1 and 2 with me please. This is King Manasseh. Now the name Manasseh means forgetfulness. Very interesting. He was a man that forgot the Lord, all right? He forgot the God of his father anyway. And it says in 2 Chronicles chapter 33 in the verse 1, Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 50 and 5 years in Jerusalem. So bearing in mind now, the first evil king after Hezekiah, he's reigning 55 years. And it says in the verse 2, But he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, like unto the abominations of the heathen, whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. Then look at chapter 33 in the verses 21 and 22. We find the next king. 55 years of an evil king goes by. And well, the Lord is angry about that. Then the next king comes along. Verse 21, Ammon was two and twenty years old when he began to reign. And he reigned two years in Jerusalem. But he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, as did Manasseh his father. So now we find 57 years have gone by where there's no godly king in Judah. No no transformation of the nation. But then look at chapter 34. We read in chapter 34 and the verse 1, finally of a godly king. Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign. Look at the verse 2. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. And then look in the verse 3. For in the eighth year of his reign, while he was yet young, 
he began to seek after the God of David, his father. So we find that, yes, Josiah came to the throne at the age of eight, but he was eight years into his reign before he even got saved. So what does that tell us? That tells us 55 years of Manasseh, two years of Ammon, a further eight years of, of Josiah, and still the nation is evil. And then look what it says in the verse 3 of chapter 34 again. And in the twelfth year he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem from the high places. So it took a further, a further 12 years, even in godly Josiah's reign, until Jerusalem finally was purged from the evil. You know, it's very basic maths. Let me put it this way. And I hope you're following me as I say this. King Josiah came to the throne approximately 641 BC. Zephaniah chapter 1 is written about 630 BC. Do you know what that tells us? That tells us that Zephaniah chapter 1, he is preaching 11 years into Josiah's reign and Josiah listens to the sermon that we've been reading in Zephaniah chapter 1. Josiah is listening to this man of God. Zephaniah is preaching and Josiah listens to him. And then within that year, then Jerusalem starts to be cleaned up. Then the high places get destroyed. Then Jerusalem turns back to the Lord. But why? Because of Zephaniah chapter 1 and verses like the verse 18, where the man of God commands the nation to come back to the Lord, leave their materialism behind, and come back to the God that they have forsaken. Look what it says again, Zephaniah 1 and the verse 18. And this is one of the warnings that goes out, ringing in Josiah's ears, ringing in the people's ears. And suddenly they realize that there must be a transformation, a reformation in the land, because neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath. There's been years... Years of abomination, years of paganism, years of Baal worship, and now finally they realize they need to turn to the Lord. But I ask, after listening to the very same sermon that Josiah listened to, will you and I have the same reaction tonight? Will you and I realize that yes, Sin is serious. God will judge sin. And we need to turn back to Christ while there's still time. Because it doesn't matter how much stuff you have. It doesn't matter about our materialism. It doesn't matter how much money you have in the bank account. Listen, you could be a pauper. You could be a prince. But it doesn't matter how much wealth you possess, friend. Neither your silver nor your gold will be able to deliver you in the day of the Lord's wrath. So I ask, will tonight, will tonight be the bankruptcy of materialism for your soul where you stop relying on your stuff and you start relying on Christ? Now I know time is short, so I want you to note three very brief things. I want you to note number one, the wealth, number two, the wanting, and number three, the wrath. Number one, the wealth. Look at the verse 18, Zephaniah 1, verse 18. Neither their silver nor their gold. Come with me to Mark chapter 8 in the verse 36, please. Mark chapter 8 in the verse 36. Here we find the Lord uh, speaking, and we find he's talking about the type of men that were about in Zephaniah's day, but also the type of people that are around in our day. And you'll listen to people, or people will be, uh, some people will be so financially astute, and there's nothing wrong with that. We are called to be good stewards with our money, but people will put away for maybe the wedding of a, a child, maybe for, for their education, maybe they'll put money away for retirement and they'll, they'll plan and they'll have this done and that laid out and all their assets in line and they're happy and they're ready to go and yet they'll think about all of these things and yet they'll forget about their soul. And they'll forget about the afterlife. And they'll forget about heaven and hell. And they make preparation for, for all of these things in years to come. And yet they don't make preparation to meeting God. And we read of a man like that in Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8 and the verse 36. Look what it says. For what shall it profit a man? For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world? And lose his own soul. 
Friend, you could become a millionaire tomorrow. You could become a billionaire tomorrow, but you could still end up in hell. You know that? The tragedy. The tragedy. It doesn't matter about your, your profits. It doesn't matter about your materialism. Let me say this. It doesn't matter about your good works either. You may think, well, well, okay, preacher, I don't have an awful lot of material things. I don't have silver and gold. I don't have these things, but I have good works. Well, let me say this, just as Zephaniah chapter 1 and the verse 18 tells us that neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath. Let me tell you this, neither your good works will be able to deliver you in the day of the Lord's wrath. In fact, let me summarize and say this, nothing we have can ever deliver us in the day of the Lord's wrath. Nothing we can offer. We can offer nothing to Almighty God to pacify Him and deliver us. Come with me to 2 Kings chapter 5 and the verse 1. 2 Kings chapter 5 and the verse 1, we find another man here that had everything the world could ever give him. We have a man here with wealth, with power, respect and esteem, Find a man that is in charge of the Syrian army, a man that has such influence, and it's the man Naaman. It says in 2 Kings chapter 5 something about this man. And it says, now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria. What a position. Here's a man that was in charge of all of the armies in the nation of Syria. It says in chapter 5 of 2 Kings in the verse 1, not only captain of the host of the king of Syria, but was a great man with his master. Now if he was captain of the army, if he was the top man in the army, then who was his master? He's talking about the king of Syria. This was a man that even the king of Syria thought was a great man. Oh, this man had everything. He had the respect. He had the power. He had the esteem. Look at the verse 1 again. He was honorable as well. All people looked at him and said, there's nobody quite like Captain Naaman. Then look what it says, because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. Look at it now. He was also a mighty man in valor. He was a strong man. You can picture him, a tall, handsome man with his armor, and he's a man of valor, and a man of strength, and a man of war. He's a man that just seems to have everything going for him that he could possibly have in this life. Yet we read at the end of that verse that he had all of these things, but it says this, but he was a leper. But he was a leper. It's the same with you and me, friend. Oh, you can have everything. You can have silver and gold. You can have good works galore. You can have church attendance coming out of your ears. You can have everything there is in life. But you're a sinner. You've broken God's law. And you're plagued with a disease called sin. And all of us, no matter what our wealth or position or materialism may be, friend, none of it will deliver us. None of it will deliver us from our sin. Come with me to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians, please. I, I want you to see a few verses here because it, it, it thrills my soul, these verses. It says in 1 Corinthians, and, and let me give you the background to these verses or the story, rather, that I want to tell you. Because there was a lady in England at the time of the Great Awakening called Lady Huntingdon. Now, she was a lady of great wealth, and she trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, and she used her money and everything she had to the glory of God, and, and she financed uh, ministers and missionaries. She built churches. She did all sorts of things and used her wealth to the glory of God. And she used to often pray this prayer, Lord, I thank thee for the letter M. You say, what on earth does that mean? I thank God for the letter M. Now let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and the verse 26. This is what she meant. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and the verse 26, it says, For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many. See the word many? doesn't say any. It says many. And she thanked God for the letter M, for it says, How that not many wise after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound 
the wise. And she thanked God for the letter M. That yes, even though she had all of these things, she endeavored to use them for God and still she could be saved by God's grace. But friend, I tell you this, if you have wealth or if you have no wealth, it really doesn't matter what you need is Christ because neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath. But I want you to note not only the wealth in the verse, look back with me in Zephaniah 1 and the verse 18, not only the wealth, but I want you to note secondly, the wanting, the wanting. Because look what it says now. Look at it with me again in the verse 18. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them. Talking about the saving of their souls talking about their redemption, talking about being right with God, talking about being redeemed and, and being spared from this destruction and this, this evil. When it says in the verse 2, I will utterly consume all things from off the land, it doesn't matter how much stuff you have, you're not going to be saved by your silver and your gold. And friend, I tell you this, because of our sin, we deserve judgment. Because of our sin, we are going to stand before God. Because of our recklessness and our, our law-breaking and our our commandment breaking because we are spiritual convicts in the sight of Almighty God. Friend, you will stand before God one day. And I tell you this, your silver and your gold will not deliver you that day. It will not deliver you that day. Money cannot save you. Wealth cannot save you. Materialism cannot save you. Good works cannot save you. Church attendance cannot save you. Giving to charity cannot save you. Being a clean living person cannot save you. You can list it off. You can ream it off, friend. None of those things will ever save you. Only Christ will save you. Only Christ. Come with me to 1 Peter, please. 1 Peter chapter 1 and the verses 18 and 19 really clarifies this point in case there's any doubt, in case there's anyone disputing what I have to say, well, look at it in the Word of God. It's plain, it's clear. It says in 1 Peter chapter 1 and the verses 18 and 19, it tells us where our redemption comes from, tells us where our salvation comes from. We read it in Jonah, salvation is of the Lord. Salvation is not of a bank account. Salvation is not of material things. Salvation is of the Lord. And it says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18, For as much as ye know that you are not redeemed, you are not saved, your sin is not washed away, you are not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. But look at this, friend. What does save us? Something far more precious than even the precious metals, silver and gold. Verse 19, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. You see, friend, if you're going to be delivered, what you need is the blood of Christ. You're going to be saved you need the blood of Christ. Only one thing can be put in Zephaniah verse 18 that will save you. And we read there, neither their silver or gold shall be able to deliver them. But we could put in there, only the blood of Christ shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath. Only the blood of Christ. You see, friend, 2,000 years ago, the Lord Jesus came to this world the Lord Jesus lived a, a perfectly righteous life. He lived a life that you and I couldn't live. He lived a life that was in, in perfect obedience to God's law. He lived a life where he fully, truly, perfectly obeyed all of the Ten Commandments. He lived a life that we fail to live even, even in an hour of a day. We break God's law all the time. But Christ, he lived 33 and a half years upon this earth and he didn't sin once. He didn't sin once in thought, in word, or in deed. And he lived a perfect life. Then, praise God, he died a perfect death. Oh, friend, he was, he was, he was betrayed and he was, he was arrested like he was a common criminal. He was beaten. He was beaten till he was black and blue. The Scriptures tell us that they, they plucked his beard and, and they spat upon his face. The scriptures tell us that, that they mocked him and they bowed down to him crying king of the Jews and they didn't mean a word of it. 
They arrayed him in purple, put a crown of thorns upon his brow to humiliate him. That's what they did. And they put a cross on his back. They made him drag it, drag it, drag it till he could carry it no longer and needed aid even carrying it up to Golgotha's hill. Then when they finally got to the top of Mount Calvary there, there they took his hands and they took his feet and, and they nailed him straight through them. They lifted him up higher and higher into the air. And you just picture the scenes, friends, of, of those nails holding him up. You, you picture the blood flowing out of thy, those, those five open wounds. You picture the precious blood being shed. And friend, I remind you, it's not silver and it's not gold that shall deliver you in the day of the Lord's wrath. It's only the precious blood. It's Christ that died. And why did he die? Christ died for the ungodly. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for who? For us. That's why the blood was shed. Something far more precious than silver or than gold. And only by trusting in that death, that that death was, was payment for your sin, only by repenting and believing that Christ did that for you. Only then will you be saved. Only then will you be delivered. Only then will you be saved. You see, friend, John 14 and the verse 6 tells us very plainly, very clearly, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Only Christ Silver or gold will not give you entrance before the Father. Good works will not give you entrance before the Father. I am the way. Christ is the only way. The cross is the only way. The blood is the only way. That's why Jesus is so emphatic when he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. But you know, when we look at Zephaniah 1 and the verse 18... It reminds us, doesn't it? Reminds us of Hebrews 2 and the verse 3. Remember that question? How shall we escape? If we neglect so great salvation, maybe you're here and you say, okay, preacher, I hear you. I hear what you say about the cross. I hear what you say about the blood. I hear what you say about the Lord Jesus Christ. I hear what you have to say, but maybe you say this, preacher, I'm still going to rely on my silver and my gold. I'm still going to rely on my wits to see me to heaven. I'm still going to rely on my good works. I'm still going to rely on my church attendance. I'm still going to rely upon me. Well, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? How shall we escape if we neglect Christ? How shall we escape if we neglect the blood? Friend, I tell you this, there is no escape. There is no escape in silver and gold. There is no escape in good works. There is no escape in church attendance. There is no escape in just being a good person. You need Christ and Christ alone. But then we see not only the wealth and the wanting, but thirdly and very quickly, the wrath. Look what it says in Zephaniah 1 and the verse 18 again. It says, Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them. Look at it. In the day of the Lord's wrath. In the day of the Lord's wrath. Friend, let me make it perfectly clear. This is not popular stuff. This is not a popular doctrine. In fact, this is a doctrine that you won't hear in the vast majority of churches today. You know why? Because so many want you to feel good as you leave. Well, I tell you, this verse isn't a feel-good verse. <laughs> the day of the Lord's wrath, that's talking about judgment. That's talking about the white throne of judgment. Come with me to Revelation 20. Revelation 20. Let's see what that's all about. Let's see what the day of the Lord's wrath is about. Let's see what it's talking about. What are we looking to be delivered from? What can't our silver and our gold deliver us from? What can only the day, uh, the, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ deliver us from? Well, look at it. Revelation 20 in the verse 11 and following. These are solemn words. These are frightening words if you're still in your sin, friend. It says in Revelation 20 in the verse 11, 
And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was no place for them. Oh, you see, friend, this is such a fearful place. You won't even have the courage to offer him your silver and your gold. When you see him and you realize your sin, you want to run, you want to hide, but there'll be no place to hide. That's what the Scriptures tell us there. Look at the verse 12. And I saw the dead, small and great, Oh, I saw the dead, those that were paupers, those that were princes. I saw those that were poor. I saw those that were wealthy. I saw the dead, small and great. All of them stand before God. And the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things that were, which were written in the books according to their works. You think of that. You think of every sinful thing you've done. Every sinful thing. It doesn't matter whether others saw it or whether it was just a secret thought in your mind. Every sinful deed you've done it is written down in a book in heaven and you'll be judged out of it. That's what we're reading here. Look at the verse 13. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell were delivered up. And death... And hell delivered up the dead which were in them, that they, uh, and they were judged every man according to their works. Look at it now, verse 14. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. You see, friend, you hear it all the time. Stephen Fry was maybe the most notable in a famous interview, and he said, what I'm going to tell God when I see him. Stephen Fry will not tell God anything. And I'll tell you this, you'll not have silver and gold to even offer him in the day of wrath. All that we need is Jesus. All that we plead is the blood of Jesus. Neither silver nor gold shall be able to deliver them. In the day of the Lord's wrath, and I appeal to you, my friend, are you ready for that day? You see, the believer, the believer will have to stand before the Lord, but they'll not have to stand before him that day because they'll be saved. Sins washed away, gone, paid for, paid for in full because Christ died for them. But if you stay in your sin... If you determine, no, I'm going to rely on silver and gold. I'm going to rely on good works. I'm going to rely upon what I can do. I'm going to rely on my materialism. Friend, let tonight for your soul be the bankruptcy of materialism. Put it all to one side. Come to Christ. Trust Him alone. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Because He's the only Savior. He's the only one that can transform your life. He's the only one that can save you at the day of judgment. He's the only one that can allow you entrance into heaven and spare you from hell. But friend, I ask you, what think ye of Christ? With, what think ye of the gospel? What think ye of the blood that was shed? What will you do with Jesus, which is called the Christ? Because neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath. Let's have every head bowed and every eye closed together, please. Let's just still ourselves before the Lord a moment. Friend, I want to ask you, before we leave, as God's Word is fresh in our minds and our memories, and as God's people are praying, will you be saved tonight? Will you trust Christ as your own and personal Savior? Friend, forget about good works. Forget about the things that you own. 
Forget about relying upon something else for salvation and come to Christ. I believe there's somebody here that needs this message tonight. I really do. Somebody here that knows they're unsaved and they need to be saved. Friend, don't put it off. Don't walk out into the darkness without Christ. But understand this. It is time to seek the Lord. If you have any questions, maybe you'd like to speak with me. Stay behind. I'm not in any rush home. I would be more than delighted to stay and open up the Bible with you and show you how you can be saved. But don't delay. Don't put it off. Tomorrow may be too late. Heavenly Father, bless thy word to every heart. Save souls, we plead. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.